Well, hello and welcome to Catalyst Church. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us today. Wherever you are, could you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. God, fill your presence in us. God, we want all you have for us. Everything, Lord, in your son's precious name. Let's worship this morning. Amen. Hallelujah.
is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our for everything you're doing. God, even though it feels like maybe the whole world's coming apart, God, we know you are in control and we trust you. We trust you to build in us everything that you intend in your son's precious name. Hallelujah. song we could ever sing, worthy of every praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. song we could ever sing, worthy of every praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside Your love. 
upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you be shaken, Lord. We, we build our house upon the rock. That is you, Jesus. Hallelujah. crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now the Savior knelt to wash our feet now at his feet we bow the one who wore our sin Oh 
of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrected. church. Let's take just a moment and just wherever you are, no matter what is happening in the room next to you, no matter what is going on, no matter how loud the kids are, just take a moment and take a deep breath. Right where you are, God's with you. And the fact that you are still breathing, the fact that you are able to take that breath means he's got a purpose, a plan, and a dream for you in this moment. Dear God, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for loving us right where we are, no matter what we feel like we're drowning in, no matter what we feel like we're facing. Help us to rest in the fact that you're with us. Dear God, we love you. And we thank you for loving us. In your wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Catalyst Church. I'm so excited to be with you today. 
here in just a few moments. We're going to jump into a message with Pastor Bill. But before we do that, I just wanted to take a minute. And especially if you're a first-time guest, if this is the first time you've clicked on, you're, you're just checking us out, I want you to know we care about you. We are so glad you chose to join us this morning. Here in a moment, you're going to see right here on the screen, 509-385-0811. If that is wrong, trust the screen, not me, because I think I just dumped it. Anyway, <laughs> we're glad you're here. And there's people standing by at the other end of that phone number. They would just love to connect with you. They would love to touch base with you and just let you know that you're not alone. Wherever you're at, whatever you're facing, we want to be there with you. And on top of that, today, I'm going to take a moment. We're going to pray over our offering. Because throughout everything that we do at Catalyst Church, it would not be possible without you, without your giving, without your generosity, your willingness to help those things happen. So thank you for it. Thank you for being faithful. Dear God, we love you. We thank you for the gifts that you have given each one of us. Whether it's time, talent, or treasure, Lord, we ask that you use us to accomplish your mission. We ask that you use us to continue to share your name with people. And we thank you for that equipping. We thank you for your leading. We look forward to what you have in store. In your wonderful name, Jesus, we thank you. Amen. Well, Catalyst Church, here we go. Well, good morning, Catalyst Church. So glad you could be with us today. If you're a guest, we are especially glad to have you with us as we are in our series, The Four Calling Birds of Christmas. Now, here's a question. How many of you follow you know, the Christmas tradition of hanging stockings around the fireplace or you know, somewhere else in your, in your home or living or whatever? You know, Stockings were a very big part of my Christmas growing up. I know they were, weren't always... I, but I cannot really recall when they began to be a larger deal for our family, you know, but stockings have always been a part of the tradition for Bobby and I and our family. Um, and I have refused to let the stockings be touched. We're changing traditions all the time and how we celebrate Christmas as a family, but I refuse to let the stockings go away, you know, which I have to admit is becoming a little bit more problematic each year because we keep adding family members, you know, both with marriages and, you know, and grandchildren now, you know, so before too much longer, it's not going to be, you know, you know, hanging the, you know, the stockings by the chimney with care. Now it's just going to be for, you know, just find a place where they fit. I am actually, and this is what's crazy, right now I am currently developing a new system for stockings in our living room. When you have to have a system for stockings, you know that there's a problem, right? But that's okay. I'm fine with it. You know, but I was thinking about traditions. I was thinking about celebrations, and, and I was struck really by how our family personally has changed the way we celebrate Christmas. You know, now that our kids are all adults and grown, it looks nothing as it did when they were younger. We've added some things, you know, we've jettisoned some others, you know, and you know, here's the question, I guess, really, how much have your own family celebrations changed over the years? Maybe this, do you even allow them to change? When was the last time you examined the traditions and celebrations that you use to see if maybe they need to be changed? Our second calling bird of Christmas is actually the first in terms of authorship. Maybe you recall last week I said that the four calling birds, you know, that traditional song, 12 Days of Christmas, may actually represent the four Gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we began with the first that's in our Bible, which is Matthew. But the truth is that Matthew was not actually the first gospel that was written. Mark's gospel was written first and likely served even as the primary source material for both Matthew's and Luke's gospel. Well, last week I mentioned how each of the gospels, each of the authors rather, sheds light on you know, different ways of, of Jesus, his life, his ministry, you know, that Matthew was, you know, a Jewish author primarily writing to a Jewish audience about the Jewish Messiah and that Jesus himself was Messiah. Well, though John Mark, who is the author of Mark's gospel, his name is actually John Mark. John Mark was also a Jew, but his audience was not. He wrote for a primarily Roman audience. 
And it actually shows in the very, I guess, terse, compact nature of the gospel. Almost, you could say that it's clearly written for a militaristic culture. You know, Mark's writing style is very concise. It's very efficient. It's very direct. You know, and his account of Jesus focuses on the actions. That shouldn't surprise us. When we imagine Roman culture, you know, a very action-oriented culture, Mark's gospel focuses so much on the actions of Jesus. You know, in fact, Mark's gospel might seem to be the least interesting from a Christmas perspective. He says absolutely nothing about the announcement or the birth or the nativity of Jesus. He says nothing about his childhood or his parents, really, or at all about his lineage. There's no angels, there's no shepherds, there's no flocks by night, there's no stars, there's no visiting magi. In fact, when we look at Mark's gospel, and turn with me if you would there to Mark's gospel, we see that the very first time Jesus shows up is at the baptism. At Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist at the River Jordan. And immediately, the action of ministry begins, according to Mark. There's no preambles, there's no setup, there's no backstory, there's no his. It's just Jesus shows up, gets baptized, and boom, here we go. Welcome to Jesus. But that's actually partially true. If we go back to the very first verse of Mark's gospel, we're going to see that his agenda shows immediately. Mark chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay, that might sound like a nice generic introduction, but it is anything but generic. It is a highly charged, controversial declaration. Before we unlock a a bit of that, let's briefly look at what Mark calls his own work, what he calls his book, his letter. He calls it a gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That word in Greek is euangelion, and it simply means, you know, good news, euangelion, the good news. And it is a brand new literary format that Mark invents because it contains good news that that God has a plan for his fallen mankind. And it is a brand new literary sense in that it is, a, uh, it is in itself a good news type of writing. You know, this also is a clue as to why I think Mark leaves out any of the, the details of Jesus' nativity. That serves no purpose to his agenda. Matthew's gospel framed the advent of Jesus in terms of his messianic role. We saw that last week, which makes sense because of Jesus' Jewish roots. Well, John Mark clearly isn't as interested in the Jewishness of Jesus. And we see it right here in verse 1. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, not everyone is aware that Christ is not actually his name. It's his role. You know, we don't ordinarily use a, a person's role as their name. You know, this is my friend, Bob Mechanic, and let me introduce you, you know, to, you know, Jack Plummer. You know, that's not normally how we culturally do things. Christ is not actually a name. Christ is a descriptor, and it means chosen one, or even better yet, anointed one. And Mark introduces his readers to, as Jesus, the anointed one. So it really isn't, you know, so Mark, you know, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the anointed one, or Jesus, the chosen one, son of God. And anointing isn't a generic description either. It points to very specific tasks. Anointing is scripture, you know, in scripture, when we see anointing, it is always for a specific purpose. It is always for a specific reason to fulfill a task or to fulfill a role. So Mark is cluing you and I in right up front. Jesus has a very specific role to fulfill and a specific function to perform. And that is really the point that I want to make, I want us to look at today. Only one point in our message today the, on the second calling bird, if you will, of Christmas, and that is this, our Savior is born to us. 
Last week we saw that our promised king would be Messiah and he would be born as a child, which was a strange thought, and that he would be for everyone, which to the Jews would be an absolutely unthinkable uh, attribute of the promised Messiah, the promised king. Today I want us to see that Mark's point to you and I, and really what I hope will become part of our Christmas celebration as we welcome Jesus, is that our Savior is born to us. Remember, I mentioned that Mark's gospel is all about action. and The primary actions that he records for Jesus center around his role as Savior of mankind. We're not going to go through the whole gospel today. If I would challenge you, though, to read it. In fact, I want to challenge you this. In the month of January, we will be doing, I'm going to be putting out there a 31-day Bible reading blitz. I'm challenging all of our Catalyst Church family to read through the entire Bible beginning to end in 31 days. So we'll be providing resources to uh, kind of a, a guide to help you do that. So I, my challenge, of course, is like read the entirety of Mark's gospel. We won't be doing it this morning. But you will see that Mark's whole point of his book, just as Matthew's was to show the Messiah, Mark's is to show the Savior. And honestly, I think we too often overcomplicate Christianity. We add too many theological questions and debates. It's actually very simple. The relationship between God and mankind was broken by sin, and nothing we do can repair that break. But God can, and he did, by sending his son to pay the price of our sin. Jesus, the Christ, Jesus, the anointed one, was sacrificed on our behalf to provide the bridge between God and us. That is it. That's the gospel. That is the euangelion, the good news. God saw the break. God fixed the break. We can debate until Jesus returns about how best you and I live this out, how best we walk out our faith in a, in a daily basis. We can debate about you know, which methods are most effective for declaring to others about Jesus. We can craft all manner of complex speculations about why God chose to redeem his broken creation. But none of our speculations or our theological ramblings will ever change what Jesus did or why. He was born to save. Jesus was not born as a, a quaint figure of folklore. He wasn't born to become the, the central personage in a religion. He wasn't born to become a cultural icon of goodness and gentleness. He wasn't born to just be an inspiring personality. Jesus was born to save God's people from the eternal penalty of their sinfulness. And then later on in the Old Testament, Peter, who by the way, interestingly enough, Peter, you know, John Mark was a, a traveling companion of Peter for many years. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 Peter writes, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. Let me look at that first section there again. Christ suffered, Christ, the anointed one, suffered for our sins for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. Jesus was born for the purpose of saving God's people from the eternal punishment of their sin. That's actually who we are celebrating this season. The one who was born to us to be Savior. Now, not for a second do I want to be, you know, bah humbug about Christmas. I just want to be certain that we don't let cultural traditions or humanist traditions decentralize the real reason Jesus was born to us. He was born to save. The Gospel of Mark unashamedly presents Jesus as the Savior of mankind, born to fulfill the Father's plan 
of redemption. Truthfully, I would say, you know, the gospel of Mark is the perfect fit for modern times. Jesus, you know, in it, Jesus moves quickly from one episode to the next. You know, events really race along at a, a very brisk pace, going from Jesus' baptism to his temptation, the call of his disciples, his preaching, his teaching, his miracles. All of it kind of tumbles into each other with hardly any description given to it, no backstory, no history, as I said. You know, and all along, Mark keeps punctuating the action with a word immediately. Immediately, Jesus did this. Immediately, Jesus did that. Then immediately, Je it's perfect for a generation who has no attention span whatsoever. Now recall, though, this was written for a Roman audience, a culture that was marked by decisive action. So it's no wonder that John Mark doesn't spend too much time in description or filling in narrative plot points. You know, the Apostle Paul, years later, when he was writing to the Corinthian believers, he made careful mention of the singularity of Jesus' ministry. We can turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to begin right there at the beginning of that chapter. Paul says this to the Corinthian believers, Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news, there's that word, euangelion, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scriptures said. He was, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scriptures said. You know, personally, I think there's a lot of modern day preaching and teaching about Jesus it tries to alter his role diminish who he is and what he did Jesus for many has become more of a helper than a savior and unfortunately i have to throw that indictment out to many pastors teachers preachers it seems that Jesus isn't Savior so much as he is assistant. Follow Jesus, and he will lead you into your best life now. I get the sentiment, but I think it's a dangerously self-serving perspective. Do I believe that Jesus will improve your life? Yes, I do. But I also believe that wasn't why he was born. Do I believe that Jesus wants you and I to live the best life that we can on this side of eternity. Absolutely. But not at the expense of righteousness. Not at the expense of maturity. Not at the expense of character. You know, a couple of years ago, several of us were decorating one of our church campuses for Christmas, and, and one of them started setting up the, the little nativity scene on a table in the foyer. They couldn't find the baby Jesus. You know, we looked, we looked, you know, but he was nowhere to be found. <laughs> you know, and, and one of us, of course, made the sarcastic remark. Okay, it was me. I made the sarcastic remark. You know, well, I guess we finally succeeded in getting Jesus out of the way of Christmas. We, we eventually found Jesus. You know, he was wrapped in a hunk of newspaper in the box. You know, but truthfully, though, there are, there's a good number of metaphors you know, that we could learn from that, that silly little moment. Metaphors about how we have altered the role of Jesus in our celebrations. Diminished, maybe even lost. The real reason that he was born at all. The calling bird of Mark's gospel won't let us cover the Savior with tinsel or candy cane. Jesus, for Mark, isn't the baby you know, in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, not to John Mark. Jesus is the Son of God, born to serve the Father's will and to become the sinless sacrifice on behalf of a lost and a broken humanity. I want to invite you 
this Christmas season, maybe this very moment, to make a decision to recognize that the Savior was born to us. Your Savior was born to you. The invitation is simple. Recognizing that Jesus was born so that he could die on your behalf. To save you from the consequence, the penalty of your sin, which is eternal punishment. I want to invite you to make a decision. The good news is that God so loved you that he sent his anointed chosen son to die on your behalf to repair that break in the relationship to welcome you back into the relationship. Would you take this moment and we pray together as you accept the gift of the Savior, his forgiveness. Pray with me if you would. Father, I thank you for the gift that is your son Jesus. I thank you that you had a plan to fix the relationship. You had a plan that would cover and forgive my sin. I'm sorry for my sinfulness. I'm sorry for the brokenness in the relationship. And I thank you for the forgiveness that Jesus offers me. I invite Jesus into my heart, into my life to make me new and whole again. Thank you for that forgiveness. Thank you for the new life that I have in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If scripture is very clear. When we pray that prayer with sincerity, and authenticity, it's not the words that are magic, it's the intent, it's the decision. We are new child of God. Born again, saved all kinds of words. We can use all kinds of words wherever you want. The point is the relationship that was broken between you and the Father is now fixed because of Jesus. We want to celebrate with you. You'll see some instructions there on your screen how you can let us know about your decision. Would you take a moment, let us know so that we can celebrate with you. We also have some resources we'd like to send out you to help you in your first steps as a brand new believing Christ follower. On behalf of all of us here at Catalyst Church, as we continue through these weeks of Advent, anticipating the arrival of our King, the arrival of our Savior, let me challenge you. Let's look at the traditions. Let's make sure that we haven't wrapped Jesus and stuffed him in the corner of a box somewhere when it comes to celebrating the birth of our Savior. Have a great week. God bless you. We'll see you again as we look at Luke's gospel next week. Amen. Thank you.